Good afternoon and welcome to this event, Does WikiLeaks Matter? This event is co-sponsored by Robert Mann's Ideas and Society program and the Thesis 11 Centre Festival of Ideas, which is currently running at La Trobe University. La Trobe, as I'm sure you know, has a strong tradition of commitment to the discussion of these kinds of matters, to public life, to public conversation. I need to begin by thanking the Wheeler Centre folks for uh, making all this possible. There are two further events, just very quickly, in the Festival of Ideas that you should know about. The first is tonight. Uh, it's a public lecture at the University of Melbourne, 221 Bouverie Street, by Professor Ron Jacobs from the State University of New York, Albany, on the global, fri global financial crisis and its media narratives. The second, which is held here tomorrow in the Experimedia Centre here at the State Library, is a four-hour event on the work of Zygmunt Bauman, the first two hours of which will be dedicated to academic content and presentation, the second two hours of which will be dedicated to uh, the viewing of film, the first documentary, the first cut of the first documentary movie about the work and life of Zygmunt Bauman will be aired then. WikiLeaks, just a couple of random themes, observations from me. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman, to whom I just referred somewhere, writes that one of the moral crises of the 19th century was that in the 19th century we believed that we could solve the problems of the world if only we had the information to tell us how to do this. In the 21st century, he suggests the crisis has somehow been reversed. We now have such an abundance of information that it's actually paralyzing. <laughs> what is it? 257,000, et cetera, WikiLeak releases. There's perhaps a cult of transparency or the enthusiasm for transparency, which goes together with this. Um, there may be too much intelligence, just as Marx once said that there was too much civilization. There are various other issues that arise, the question of the image of the charismatic leader in the figure of Julian Assange, not least, for example, when you happen to watch him, as, as I did, together with John Pilger on television, Antipodeans making trouble on the world stage, which might be a bit of a conceit. Now, Rob Mann and Guy Rundle, as I'm sure you both know, have been digging deep into these archives, into this information. And in Rob's case, uh, trying to find his way through the labyrinth, the proverbial riddle wrapped in an enigma. Uh, Guy's been digging in the same place and has a book to come which will result from these excavations. Uh, we've decided today that they'll uh, bookend this event. Uh, Rob will begin and Guy will close. Um, I'm presuming that you know them by, by their works. Uh, Robert Mann, of course, is Professor of Politics at La Trobe University, consistent contributor to the press, to the daily press, perhaps especially to the monthly, uh, and most recently author of that splendidly titled book, Making Trouble Indeed. Uh, Guy Rundle has taken the long march from arena to crikey. He's... Uh, <laughs> He's an acute, as you know, an acute uh, synoptic journalist who's written about extraordinary matters, whether in one register in the realm of comedy or through to Frankston, from Frankston to Detroit. Uh, he's still sufficiently old-fashioned with us to yesterday have quoted William Morris in The Age, for which I think we should thank him, but not now. Uh, these uh, bookends... Um, appropriately the, at, the, at the Wheeler Centre at the State Library, uh, will be intermediated by two of our visitors uh, for the Thesis 11 Festival Ideas. Uh, so Rob will begin. Rob will be followed by Eleanor Townsley, who is professor at the Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts, who's um, kindly agreed to be with us today. Uh, she'll be followed by Professor Peter Vale, uh, who until recently was Nelson Mandela Professor at uh, Rhodes University and is now the Professor at Large at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, then uh, Guy will take his turn and there'll be some sufficient good time for 
discussion. But we begin with Robert Mann. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, well, if I can uh, thank Peter for the introduction. It's, uh, we're very old friends at La Trobe, and it's great to do something with him and his thesis 11. I also thank you all for um, coming. I, I'm astonished at the size of the audience, and particularly because football match you've torn yourself away from. Um, as is my want, when I don't want to um, get things slightly wrong, I'm going to uh, talk from something I've written. Um, and as I say, there'll be plenty of time for questions. Now, WikiLeaks was founded on the basis, in my view, of two fundamental intellectual discoveries. The first arose from Julian Assange's long membership of the email listing known as the Cypherpunks. The Cypherpunks were concerned about the battle between the individual and the state in the age of the internet. They believed that because of two developments, public key cryptography, basically a cryptography that individuals could get hold of, through, and that's second, a software program known as PGP, pretty good privacy, individuals would now be able to communicate with each other in cyberspace free from any possibility of state surveillance. Julian Assange, who was a member of the email uh, list, was the inheritor of this idea, perfect communication without dangerous state surveillance, but he was not its source. It came from the cypherpunks. The second discovery which makes WikiLeaks was Julian Assange's alone. From the possibility of unbreakable communication between individuals, he devised a revolutionary strategy based on the relations that might be created between whistleblowers across the globe and WikiLeaks, an extra territorial organisation that he created. Seems strange, but only a few years ago. He regarded both states and business corporations as conspiracies maintained by their monopoly of communications in the fields relevant to them. They could, he wrote, be throttled, his word, if the conspirators lost confidence in their ability to communicate with each other in secrecy. In previous ages, conspiracies had been challenged by kidnappings or assassinations. In the age of the internet, they could be challenged, he believed, by insider leaks. At the core of WikiLeaks, then, was this single thought. If those privy to the work of the conspirators inside states or corporations were able to leak their documents without fear of discovery, and if these documents could then be published to the world in the clear light of day, the conspirators would lose their capacity to maintain their clandestine communications with each other. Their conspiracy would be crushed. Assange clearly believed that some states and some corporations were more corrupt than others. Because of the existence of WikiLeaks in the struggle between the more and the less corrupt states and corporations, the more worthy would triumph, the less worthy would be exposed so he believed. This thought amounted to what I call political and corporate Darwinism, the survival not so much of the fittest but the best. The kind of revolution Assange envisaged did not rest on new political or economic arrangements, so far as I can see, but on the emergence of a new moral order. WikiLeaks is often misunderstood at its origin, it was not primarily an anti-American organization. Although it was strongly opposed to the authoritarian tendencies of the Bush administration, it was even more interested in the liberating potential of leaks originating in China, Russia, and the corrupt regimes of Central Asia and Africa. Insofar as it appeared to become an anti-American anti organization, it is because of the fact 
that by far the most important leaks it received came from the American state in 2010, the Afghan and Iraq war logs, and of course the quarter of a million cables from the State Department. What WikiLeaks now discovered was the paradox that leaks are far more likely to emanate from the relatively speaking more open rather than less open states. It also discovered, discovered something that could not have been anticipated at its foundation, namely that it was precisely leaks from the United States that had the potential to galvanise opinion in more authoritarian states. The release of the State Department cables ha had minimal impact on the reputation of the United States. They played, however, a, sig a significant part as a catalyst in the North African uprising of recent months by undermining the reputation, in particular, of the ruling family in Tunisia. Nor, in my opinion, was WikiLeaks primarily a left-wing organisation. Assange regarded it as vital to its mission that it published authentic documents including those emanating from conservative people and forces. He was privately rather contemptuous of the conventional Western left, in part because he did not accept its analysis of contemporary racism and imperialism, in part because he believed much of the Western left was narcissistic and self-serving, and in part because among his greatest heroes were anti-communists like Solzhenitsyn, who had challenged the Stalin state. WikiLeaks has now, however, assumed a position on the left, in part because of the enmity it has earned from the United States, in part because once uh, that enmity was manifest, Assange's staunchest and most uh, articulate supporters were to be found on the John Pilger, Tariq Ali left, and in part because in publishing material on the corruption of corporations, WikiLeaks' work aligns itself with one of the central strands of conventional contemporary left analysis. It is on this question, on the question of the corporate power, that he split from the anarcho-capitalist libertarians of the right who formed the dominant strand among the cypherpunks. The question is often asked, is WikiLeaks a media or a political organisation? Although Assange has recently begun to claim that it is a media organisation, that is purely tactical. If he is indicted by the US grand jury on the charge of conspiracy with Bradley Manning for breaches of the 1917 Espionage Act, Assange's primary line of defence will almost certainly be that WikiLeaks is a conventional publishing house with him, himself as its editor-in-chief. This is understandable, but in essence false. Assange did not create, in my view, and then devote his life to WikiLeaks to improve the quality of journalism. He gave his life to it, as his fascinating blog entries under IQ.org of 2006 make clear, in order to inspire revolution across the globe. If Assange's primary motivation then is revolutionary and political, since the establishment of WikiLeaks in 2006, his steepest learning curve is, con is connected with the question of the media. At the origin of WikiLeaks, Assange hoped that once their authenticity had been ver verified, Mere publication of the documents sent to WikiLeaks was all that would be necessary for the cleansing capacity of the truth, which he puts with a capital T, to have its effect. The first document WikiLeaks published concerned Somalia. Assange believed that it would be seized upon and analysed by thousands of Somalis languishing in the refugee camps and have, as a consequence, an immediate and galvanising political impact. More generally, he had been inspired by the Wikipedia movement in which millions had contributed, sorry, to which millions had contributed. He thought that the documents secretly delivered by whistleblowers to WikiLeaks 
would be subject to collective analysis in a similar way. At this time, he hoped that the publication of leaked documents concerning state and corporate malfeasance and corruption would not require the participation of the mainstream media. Assange was quickly stripped of his illusions. Neither the interested oppressed populations at that time nor independent anal analysts in the Wikipedia model offered the kind of penetrating analyses of the documents that he had rather naively anticipated. By 2010, when the massive US contemporary archive was posted to WikiLeaks, Assange understood that relations between WikiLeaks and the most important conventional mainstream media had become unavoidable if he was to fulfill the promise of maximum exposure to the whistleblowers who sent material to his site. Ever since this decision was made to work with conventional media or press, relations between WikiLeaks and the newspapers chosen, especially the Anglophone ones, the New York Times and the Guardian, have grown increasingly estranged. Superficially, this is a matter of clashing egos. More deeply, it is a matter of incompatible ambitions. The mainstream press on which WikiLeaks has relied is driven by the liberal ambition to bring into the light secret information it believes the public has a right to know. WikiLeaks is driven not only by that, but also by the revolutionary ambition to use leaks as a means of deauthorizing and thus crushing illegitimate state and corporate power wherever it exists. Uh, Assange and the Guardian New York Times were on a crash course and they crashed. During the course of its brief history, WikiLeaks has, in my view, erred in one fundamental way. After convincing itself that the documents sent to it are authentic, and not forged, the WikiLeaks commitment has been to publish without further thought. I will call this the WikiLeaks philosophy of publication <coughs> automaticity, publication automaticity. Almost all WikiLeaks ethical and political problems have arisen from this category mistake. Nothing has done the reputation of, of WikiLeaks more harm than the decision to publish unredacted the names of perhaps 300 Afghans who supplied NATO forces with intelligence. Obviously, this placed their lives at risk. The documentary CNN screened a day ago, which I've just read about this morning, yet again proved this point. It remains the key charge brought against Assange in the court of conservative, uh, ma even mainstream, Western public opinion. It was my first thought um, before I got really interested uh, in, in Assange against him. Although it is not easy for Assange to admit error, in this case he has. In a different and also admittedly a less self-evident way, it also seems to me that Assange made a serious mistake when he published the ClimateGate emails of the University of East Anglia climate scientists which had been hacked into by right-wing denialists. This, publish, uh, this publication played a not insignificant part in the rise of climate change denialism throughout the English-speaking world, and even some part in the failure of the 2009 Copenhagen Conference, which future generations may come to see as the Munich moment of our contemporary era. With the publication of leaks, as with all aspects of political and, ethic and ethical life, in my opinion, judgment is required. Automaticity is a mistake. In my view, this mistake is linked to another uh, commonly attributed to WikiLeaks, partly accurately, partly not, which has done its reputation harm. Uh, this is the idea that human life can be or should be conducted without secrets of any kind. This is not, put this way, an argument Assange defends. He always acknowledges a certain rather limited right to privacy. He, he normally, in this case, speaks about one's medical records. Yet because his defense of privacy has been so narrow, 
This has exposed him to the charge of hypocrisy, uh, for example, over his own um, trial, coming trial in Sweden, where he has looked for privacy absolutely rightly and been uh, appalled by the way in which records have been given to the press to harm him. Even the case which he truly does argue that collectivities, families, neighbourhoods, communities, corporations, states should ideally manage their affairs without secrets of any kind is not, in my view, even remotely sustainable. Assange was momentarily uncertain when he was asked by a journalist from The Economist on one occasion whether he would publish details of the D-Day landing if they had been received by WikiLeaks before it had occurred. He might more recently have been asked whether he would have published in advance details of the raid on Osama bin Laden's Pakistani residence. The idea with which WikiLeaks is popularly associated, total transparency, is in my view in the end incoherent and ultimately undefendable. All that Assange really needs to defend is the ideal of greatest possible transparency. This idea has very great contemporary resonance. Almost everyone is aware that we live now in an age of unrelenting political spin and breathtaking mendacity. In my view, the accent of WikiLeaks should fall not on total transparency, but on the unremitting exposure of the practices of corruption and injustice that rely on secrecy and that seclude themselves in darkness. The idea of automaticity of publication and the idea of total transparency, absolute transparency, are closely parallel utopian illusions. In human affairs, the intervention, something best called judgment, will always, in my view, remain indispensable. To conclude, does WikiLeaks matter? In my view, it does. It has already struck many keen blows against injustice and corruption. In his seminal essay, The Power of the Powerless, Václav Havel demonstrated how, under conditions of post-totalitarianism, individuals who straighten their backbones can undermine illegitimate authority. Julian Assange has already shown that this can be achieved also under conditions of democratic consumer capitalism. His example of intelligence and courage has acted as an inspiration to many, especially younger activists across the globe. I even think of my younger daughter who's involved in the climate change debate. Although it seems likely that the direct influence of WikiLeaks will decline for some considerable time, perhaps for good, as Assange's legal battles in Sweden and the United States overtake him, it also seems certain that other anonymous whistleblower sites fashioned on the model of WikiLeaks will emerge to take its place. More important than those created by his more timid former colleagues, like uh, Domscheit Begg's OpenLeaks, or those sponsored by newspapers, um, already, God help us, uh, Rupert Murdoch's Wall Street Journal, is uh, threatening to create a site like this of its own. I personally am looking forward to the day when there exist whistleblower websites sponsored by human rights organisations or NGOs. I'm looking forward to the day, for example, when a Bradley Manning in one of the fossil fuel corporations sends encrypted information about her company's climate change disinformation campaign to a site specially created for such a purpose by, let us say, Greenpeace. When this day arrives, it will be due to the astonishing creativity of uh, fellow Melbourneian Julian Assange. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Eleanor Townsley grew up in Queensland, took her first degree from the, the University of Queensland, took a PhD from the University of California. Uh, her sphere of influence and uh, m most of her activity is felt in the United States where she's a major representative of cultural sociology and a leading analyst of the media. Eleanor.
Oh. Hi, thanks for that introduction, Peter. It's lovely to be here today and um, see so many people um, coming out. It's a holiday weekend, right? So uh, we were told that there was going to be a forum and the question was, does WikiLeaks matter or what is the value of WikiLeaks? And there's been a lot of fine um, things written on that topic, um, most strikingly Roberts um, in the monthly recently. But I guess what's most striking to me here about WikiLeaks is not really the story about our heroes and villains and not really uh, the story about individuals at all, but I think the institutional story. And the first part of the institutional story that interests me is the way the WikiLeaks site was imagined. So not only the idea to build a way for sources like whistleblowers, like Bradley Manning, to securely funnel information to a central site, but also, importantly, the way the site itself inevitably became imagined as part of a circuit of media institutions in a much larger institutional landscape. Um, and so we see WikiLeaks, of course, forwarding on information to the mainstream press so that it ends up being publicised through regular media channels. And I think that's fascinating because it shows that despite the anti-establishment culture and language of the WikiLeaks project, and despite its stated ambivalence about corporate media, WikiLeaks is nonetheless, um, or perhaps inevitably, closely connected to the established media landscape. Um, the WikiLeaks project has always really relied on ideas that are central to professional journalism, including ideas about the role of political transparency and good information in democratic deliberation. So that's the idea that people require good information to make good decisions, to know how to vote, um, or to know how to make good policy choices. So it, it's in this context, I guess, that I'd reflect on the surprise evinced by Julian Assange and others in the alternative press in the United States and elsewhere at the lack of response to some of the information that WikiLeaks has brought to light. Um, after all, while there may have been some important effects, Overall, of course, governments have not tumbled um, and it doesn't feel like the world has been made anew, certainly not in the United States. And I guess from an institutional perspective, I would argue that the lack of response to WikiLeaks, certainly um, prior to the Bradley Manning moment, is only surprising if a traditional model of the media as a somewhat neutral co conduit for information is in fact a good description of the way mediated deliberation works in the very highly complex societies we inhabit, which it probably um, is not. Um, information typically has effects um, in the process of analysis, of interpretation, of performance, and in the connection to ongoing narratives. So the thing that I find interesting here is that despite the claims for innovation and newness for WikiLeaks, and it certainly is extremely innovative and new in important ways, it remains the case that the WikiLeaks project in its conception is closely tied to very traditional understandings of how journalism and media work, particularly in the Western democracies. So a second part of the institutional story that I would emphasize um, in this connection is how that very big cache of secure documents from Bradley Manning was slowly processed and publicized in an unprecedented institutional um, international cooperate, um, cooperation or collaboration between five major newspapers, The Guardian, The New York Times, um, Der Spiegel, Le Monde and El Pais. Um, as The Guardian editor Alan Ruspridger writes in his account of WikiLeaks published earlier this year, and I quote, one of the lessons from the WikiLeaks project is that it has shown the possibilities of collaboration. It's difficult to think of any comparable example of news organizations working together in this way. Um, I think all five editors would like to imagine ways in which we could harness our resources again. So I think this part of the institutional story is also very important because it shows not only that the functioning of the WikiLeaks site is dependent on quite traditional um, kinds of journalistic philosophy that information will in some ways make us free, um, uh, truth with a capital T, but also importantly that the WikiLeaks project relied on and also helped to produce an unprecedented institutional collaboration of these national newspapers acting together on an international stage in a highly organised way. And I don't think it's a big surprise that WikiLeaks chose to work through print outlets rather than, say, the internet alone or radio or television. 
These newspapers are the most elite and prestigious institutions in their respective journalistic fields with enormous international influence. Several are also papers of record of powerful nations, so their collaborative involvement with WikiLeaks lent their authority to WikiLeaks as a source and to the facts that were published. A major consequence of this was that WikiLeaks and its information could not be easily dismissed or sidelined by other powerful national and international actors. And I think this speaks in an important way to emerging understandings of a global civil society and a global public sphere of political communication, political accountability and political legitimacy. All this rests too on a growing sense of an international public, an idea that finds its counterpart in the imagined publics and markets and audiences and masses of an increasingly international social media. To be sure, an international public has long been imagined, but it is not always easy to summon or to mobilise. In this case, I think it was invoked in, invoked in a particularly robust and interesting way by the combined authority of these big five newspapers and the large transnational publics to which they address themselves. I mean, at the same time, I would point out they were all European language newspapers, and so although very influential, we're talking about a far from perfect representation or institutional invocation of international publics. So I think once the connections of the traditional project of professional journalism became apparent, and they certainly were underlined by the collaboration of these venerable news outlets in publishing the materials provided by WikiLeaks, then it's not surprising that Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks project have become hero figures for Western journalists who remain committed to investigative journalism and the power of information. Um, it's a project, of course, with which many intellectuals feel sympathy, I think. At the same time, I guess I'm concerned that the fascination with individuals like Assange do tend to direct our attention away from the very interesting institutional story and the very deep continuities that we see between the WikiLeaks imagined project and professional journalism and traditional ideas about the role of information in democratic societies on this new stage. So that's really um, my two cents and I hope we get back to it in discussion. This is Peter Vale. He's lived a life around the world, but mainly in South Africa. Uh, I connect his life experience with at least three words. All of them start with S. Struggle, security in the state. Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Um, on Saturday afternoon... Um, the participants in the ThinkFest were taken for a walk around Melbourne's uh, graffiti and uh, wall art uh, experience. And in Hosier Lane, near the top, there is a four, panel, four series of panels on Julian Assange. And underneath there, someone has put a paste over of the Madonna and a, um, a kind of whimsical, thoughtful man looking at it and the, uh, the piece of graffiti reads, hmm, something about Mary. <laughs> and I couldn't help, when I saw this, think of this, uh, this uh, thought and thinking about WikiLeaks. There's a sort of sense of this is something miraculous that's happening. I want to agree with uh, Robert that WikiLeaks matters. But I really want to approach this from um, the point of view of what I would call disciplinary, academic disciplinary power and practice. I learned um, uh, my politics and my uh, academic life through the discipline of international relations. And it seems to me that if you understand the discipline, you understand fundamentally that this is America's world, that the world we have created is America's world. And so we believe that keeping America's secrets is in our own interests to keep. States encourage us, in a sense, to believe that America's secrets are our own secrets. 
And I think the one thing that WikiLeaks has done is really to undercut fundamentally that understanding that America's secrets are perhaps not our secrets, that America's secrets are perhaps aimed at a particular kind of understanding and surveillance of the world. And this is an understanding and surveillance which I believe is supported fundamentally by the disciplinary and institutional power of how we understand the world through the discipline of international relations. So it seems to me there is a conflict here, a fundamental conflict between what WikiLeaks has done and what we've been encouraged to understand about the world. And if you really want to understand that world, America's world, and in a second I'm going to say it seems to me some of Australia's world too, is um, try to get into an American embassy in Cape Town or in Johannesburg or in Pretoria. Approach the building and see how difficult it, it is to get in. Each of these looks like the green zone in Iraq. And so what I think has happened here in WikiLeaks is that we've been shown that this is a world of hollow feet. I say Australia too because it seems to me that, and there are many Australians in this room, and I know there's only one other South African in this room, so let me be careful how I say this. It seems to me too that you're caught in the coattails of this kind of world that has been created in this way. And what WikiLeaks has done and what Assange has done is essentially to decouple you from that understanding. Maybe America's security isn't our security. Maybe America's security isn't Australia's security. I say Australia because it's really difficult to get into this country. And it's very difficult to get into this country even as a visitor, even as an academic visitor. And I think part of the reason for that is essentially in the aftermath of 9-11 that you have taken on all of those understandings of America's worldview in the, in the, at this particular time. What I think he's done is that uh, uh, WikiLeaks and, uh, and Assange himself have pulled away some of the threads that we understand that to be. We in the South understand, I think, fundamentally that this is an American constructed world. We understand fundamentally that perhaps our interests are not served by these secrets. And we in South Africa understand this acutely because in the aftermath of 9-11, when Bush went crazy and passed all of this legislation, we could see and indeed wrote about the fact that what he had created was a security system which, hey, surprise, surprise, looked like the final moments of apartheid. As, apartheid, as the apartheid government was struggling to keep itself together to look after its own security, it went after the newspapers and anyone who was a free thinker. So my point is this. In my view, anything that undercuts this particular perspective, this particular understanding that this form of modernity is important, that this form of modernity is emancipatory, is a good project. I just want to say one other thing, if I can, and that's why is it that the left always looks for men on white horses and always looks for white men on white horses? And with respect to Robert and all the good citizens of Melbourne, let me say this. It seems to me that there are many people out there struggling in the third world, in Africa and in Asia, who uh, are... Uh, tackling these big problems, these big issues, these, un these overthrowing of the nature of the American world in which we live, who are equally as heroic as uh, Julian Assange. And here I think of Dr. Benedict Sen, the Indian dissident who's recently been um, uh, uh, convicted for 20 years in prison for purportedly uh, uh, furthering the aims of... Uh, of the Maoist insurrection. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. The last word. Guy Randall. Uh, 
Um, I'll, uh, I have to remind myself, and I've spent so much time thinking about WikiLeaks and talking about WikiLeaks over the past six months, uh, that I have to remind myself not to take um, things for granted in talking about it. On the one hand, uh, I think unquestionably WikiLeaks uh, matters, has changed the world, uh, has created something fundamentally new, and that it's worth focusing on the single exemplary uh, um, uh, behaviour and project that Julian Assange has created. I often forget to say, I think, that a lot of this, uh, a lot of what is attributed to a thing called WikiLeaks and to a person called Assange is a far more complex, chaotic and multiple process. Um, a lot of what, in retrospect, looks like some smooth, high-functioning operation uh, has obviously been, when you look at it uh, in any more depth, chaotic from the start, uh, contingent in some ways, uh, and, and depended on its good and ill fortune for what has substantially originated. So um, in, in speaking about WikiLeaks, I think it's important, and I'll try and bring this out a, a bit later, to remember that we're talking about a very complex process and, and we're kind of using this as a shorthand. I think there's three ways in which WikiLeaks matters. Um, the particular way in the, uh, uh, the, the particular scandals, the particular issues it's brought to the fore, the particular things it's pushed on, uh, a political way, that is, that it's shown a new process of political determination within a milieu that had, had uh, suffered uh, a series of tactical defeats and, and was to a degree confused about how to go forward. And thirdly, as a more general process, a particular representative of a far more general process, which is the transformation of politics, the state, human society, by, by the online revolution that has occurred over the last two decades. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that a whole series of, of issues have been pushed to a state that, they wouldn't, that wouldn't have otherwise occurred if it hadn't been for WikiLeaks. And one of the interesting processes that has occurred over the last few years since you know, WikiLeaks was founded in 2006, you know, a beat of an eyelid ago, is that people forget what has actually been seeded by WikiLeaks. One of the processes which occurs is that the particular intervention of WikiLeaks is subsumed into a more general uh, situation, an idea that that must have always happened, that that was always going to happen. Um, uh, one of the main examples of that, one of the, the principal examples... Uh, was the recent, uh, or recent, about two years ago now, uh, uh, release of a whole lot of Icelandic banking documents, the so-called Ice Save uh, documents. Ice Save was a, um, a specific fund that was started by the Icelandic banks in their most florid, manic stage, in which they thought that Iceland uh, could be a world financial player. It offered huge rates of interest on, on current account. Uh, uh, for current account holders through British and French banks. Uh, when the Icelandic economy collapsed, uh, those collapsed too. The British and French put uh, pressure on Iceland to, uh, to guarantee all those accounts. Uh, and Iceland was looking to go into the same situation that Greece uh, and Ireland did in that its politicians would just meekly um, sell the family silver, sell up the assets of the state in order to pay off for the actions of, of a few uh, carpetbaggers. Uh, at that point, WikiLeaks released a huge amount of documents that had been leaked to it concerning the Iceland, uh, the IceSave accounts and what had, abs what had really gone on. And in a politically conscious, uh, highly aware country like Iceland, that seemed to prove the... Uh, the final catalyst, something that pushes you over the threshold. And there was basically a, a peaceful revolution in Iceland, if you like. There were mass demonstrations. The government fell. A new government was constituted. It made some sort of deals for repayment with the Western powers. But crucially, it didn't do what Greece and Ireland uh, did, which was to take a massive haircut. And it has proved all the better for Iceland. You know, Ireland has, has headed further into 
economic depression, uh, Iceland is doing all right. And recently, in a third, um, a third referendum, the Icelandic people once again uh, rejected uh, a deal that would see them, uh, see them pay these things off. Now, whether or not they have a moral right to pay these things off is another question, but I think it's unquestionable that what happened there was a particular function or was contributed to massively by the WikiLeaks effect, and that is that a huge number of documents made it unquestionable that something corrupt had occurred, but equally importantly, made it visible for everybody. So there was no possibility of pretense on either side anymore that we didn't know what was going on, we didn't know what you guys were doing, and uh, we didn't really... Uh, we knew you didn't know that sort of thing. Everybody knew. It's 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 like you know it's like a scene in a farce where the, the screen comes down and everybody's naked. Um, there is a point of recognition at which something must occur for the sake of your own political honour, for the sake of your own political being. You can no longer pretend uh, that business as usual can occur. That it seems to me in its first stage, its pre sort of uh, war logs stage was WikiLeaks at its best. And there were half a dozen sort of scandals like that of varying magnitudes. Um, what was important in, the, in this sort of way, I think, was an innovation in WikiLeaks' approach, um, which, which uh, Robert touched on to a degree, initially as a failed approach, which was that they would release mass numbers of documents and they would then... Uh, hope that people would wiki interpret them, spread them around, and that this would create a catalyst effect whereby people would rise up. Uh, in the ice save situation, they began to realise that working with uh, me, uh, more traditional media organisations and also sharpening, um, uh, synthesising uh, the material would also help. So, in fact, Icelandic state TV did take up this material uh, very substantially and, uh, and broadcast a series of, of, of documentaries on this. So um, it is that quantitative uh, innovation combined with the synthesising process of interpretive media um, that of itself creates something more than an old whistleblower. Uh, it's something more than the old idea of the smoking gun effect. You know, the smoking gun, the one document that shows that uh, that something bad is going on. Uh, I don't know if people remember this in the sort of the era of the sort of Ralph Nader's struggle against the car companies and, and they're building unsafe cars. There was a document that Ford had circulating in its uh, in its internal. Um, uh, uh, business, which was about the Ford Pinto, and the Ford Pinto was a car that had a uh, one minor problem, which was that its petrol tank would sometimes explode if another car hit it at very low speeds. And there was a document in which someone had calculated how many of these this could happen, how much they would have to pay out, Ford would have to pay out in terms of wrongful death suits and that sort of thing, for it to be worthwhile for them to continue to produce the Ford Pinto with an exploding fuel tank. Um, now, that's your, you know, that's your archetypal smoking gun because instantly, uh, um, uh, you know, someone has really just set it out as a series of accounts. The problem is, the problem is multiple here, however. As you get more and more of these smoking guns... Uh, they start to lose their effect. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is when you no longer have a more contestatory political culture that you had in the, the three decades following the Second World War, when people have become more resigned to large power structures, then people actually don't want to hear about those smoking guns because all it reminds you of is your powerlessness. It reminds you that you can't do anything. So they don't want those individual um, stories and crises, but when you have a large... Uh, a large amount of material and it's handled in the right way, uh, something happens. That seems to me the uh, why WikiLeaks matters in that ref respect. And that is not accidental in the sense that it's related to Assange's particular theorisation of how these things work in, in a paper he wrote called about uh, conspiracy and governance, arguing that one way to look at governments was as types of conspiracies. Um, and that once you looked at them as conspiracies, you could think of contesting them as a way of breaking up the conspiracy. And the leak 
then becomes the way of breaking up the conspiracy because it has several effects. A leak, uh, if you can encourage leaks by a safe uh, site like WikiLeaks, which allows people to leak information without it being a suicidal mission, uh, then the leaks change the ratio of information between the inside of the conspiracy, the state, and the outside of the conspiracy, the rest of us. Um, they introduce mistrust within the conspiracy because everybody's looking around and going, well, who's leaking? Are you leaking? Are you leaking? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the conspiracy must then spend energy on its own, on, on limiting the leak from within its own processes, so its own internal security, rather than on what it's doing to the outside of the conspiracy, which, you know, oppression or wars or things like that. And ultimately and finally, the conspiracy has to break itself up. It has to split itself into different parts. So in a, in a dictatorship uh, or, a, or a, an oppressive regime, that becomes, you know, a process of playing people off against each other and that sort of thing. And you can see, you know, in history that that is often the end game, the final stage of an oppressive regime. Um, in, a, in a more democratic, uh, open, semi-open society like a US government, it becomes a process of introducing classification systems, secret, top secret, that sort of thing, and multiple spy agencies. Um, and uh, uh, the idea is then to force the conspiracy to be less effective by splitting itself up than it otherwise would be if it was totally internally open. So in that respect, I think... Uh, there are many sort of critiques you can make of that and, uh, in, in a longer session. But what is important to realise, I think, about WikiLeaks is that this wasn't an accident. It wasn't stumbled upon. It was a process of one person thinking out a particular um, political dilemma in the 2000s, which was um, uh, the rise and fall of the, cap uh, the, an capitalist, the anti-capitalist globalisation movement and the particular limits that it had faced challenging um, uh, repressive state powers uh, in what we used to call the third world. Um, uh, Assange famously went to Kenya for the World Social Forum, which was the sort of the, you know, the, the social movements sort of um, opposite to the World Economic uh, Conference, the Davos sort of uber conspiracy, if you like. Um, and his feeling there was, was uh, you know, as Robert referred to, that it was a lot of people making videos of each other, um, that it had, uh, it had collapsed into a form of ultra-openness, uh, ultra-networking uh, that really became narcissistic and was also in relationship uh, to concerted conspiracies uh, absolutely ineffective and counterproductive. So what you then needed was a counter-conspiracy uh, and... Uh, a counter-conspiracy that dealt not merely in the quality of information it was releasing, but the quantity. So all that was theorised. Um, uh, all that was thought through. Um, and that was, if you like, um, Assange and a couple of other people, but uh, I think it's fair to say it was, it was uh, one person sitting down and trying to nut out what was going on. Um, taking certain elements from the tradition he'd come up through, which was the cypherpunks and the sort of the weird twilight hinterland of, of, um, of, of late 80s political hacking, teenage sort of political hacking, um, uh, and that sort of world, which really didn't have a lot of baggage of the old left uh, or the, the sort of debates that were going on as the old left became the new left, became the new new left, became the capitalist anti-globalisation movement and so forth and so on. However, in terms of the radical individualism, uh, even the atomization of that movement, I think Assange then took on something of what was coming through on the other side of these mass global social movements which were trying to look for ways to work collectively and to make an impact that was more than simply bearing witness, that, that was actually... Uh, such a punch that it uh, it made a categorical shift in power. I've always been interested in the fact that uh, Assange has long said that um, 
you know, one of his inspirations is Souls and Itzen, um, and uh, especially Cancer Ward, um, Darkness at Noon by Kersler, and uh, he will then he's then want to quote some some reasonably obscure German sort of anarcho communists uh, from the early twentieth century. I've been, been interested in the fact that that. Solzhenitsa and Kersler are Miltonic works, if you like, in that the devil sometimes has all the best lines. They have a lot of power in them because they are not merely anti-Stalinist or uh, that sort of thing. They're also interested in the way that those works uh, have an ambivalent attitude to the political will of Leninism, uh, its transformational quality and that sort of thing. It's fascination with that. And I've always seen a loosely useful, very limited analysis, um, comparison that, that WikiLeaks in that respect has a, Len- a Leninist bit of oomph to it in its determination to make categorical change in the world, to make an expression of political will on behalf of an idea it believes to be right, that it's that sort of summoning of political audacity uh, in that respect that makes it different to a whole lot of the other sort of open leaks um, uh, crypto sort of websites who celebrate the idea of openness and who celebrate the idea that openness of itself will occur. And in fact, as we now know from, from books like Daniel Domscheitberg's Inside WikiLeaks and that sort of thing, the crucial split, quite aside from any personality peccadilloes of Assange himself, the crucial split within WikiLeaks as it had come together over the years from 2007 and 2009 was Assange's determination that they should focus everything uh, on the three war logs. They had the uh, Iraq, Afghan and and Cablegate logs to the expense of being a general general sort of leaks clearinghouse with a whole lot of other information they had that they should really make this uh, a total focus, even though it would then inevitably have them labelled as simply sort of uh, traditional anti-Americans focusing on America, you know, why didn't you leak Chinese documents and so forth and so on. I think Assange was willing to take that risk, which also involved obviously, you know, a risk of of going up against the most powerful country in the world uh, with an enormous legal, political, military reach. Um, and other people in the uh, the organisation clearly weren't. Some of them uh, have been honest enough to say so. Some of them have, have said that, uh, you know, there's many reasons why a lot of us left WikiLeaks, but uh, as Rob Gongrick, one of the uh, the Dutch people, said, I left because I was scared shitless of what Assange was doing and I didn't want any part of it. Uh, not that he thought it was wrong. Uh, he just thought uh, that it was so crazy brave that there was no... Uh, uh, that he just couldn't bring himself to do it. So in that respect, one can agree one shouldn't focus on, one shouldn't focus on heroes um, if one is thinking about the idea of unquestionably more sort of moral people through and through in every res- aspect of their life, and one shouldn't focus on unitary processes in a simple, naive sort of way. Nevertheless... Uh, if one doesn't see that some people do actually stand up and resynthesize a whole process, create something out of nothing, uh, and then uh, act in an exemplary fashion that they hope will encourage courage in other people, uh, then you don't really have an understanding of how to make large-scale political change. And that's one thing that Assange and WikiLeaks has resupplied uh, in the current era, and one reason why people find him so inspirational, because he's not content to bear witness. He's not content to simply make his protest uh, and let it be an expression of conscience. He really wants to structurally change things. Now, in that respect, I think that leads on to the, to the final aspect of WikiLeaks, and I'll try and be quick here, the, um, which is how it relates to the more general process that we're undergoing at the moment. WikiLeaks, in this respect, I think, is one political expression, one way of doing something in an era in which the whole constellation of power, information and the state is changing uh, as epochally as it did in the 17th century when the modern state and political systems were born. The modern state, the, the territorially limited 
nation state was born of the Westphalia Treaty in 1648. The Westphalia Treaty came at the end of the Thirty Years' War, which had devastated Europe as a, as a, a sort of knockdown, drag out uh, fight between Protestantism and Catholicism. And it became clear to people that this idea of interleaving powers, the power of the church and the power of the state, etc., etc., was a recipe for chaos and something else had to be created uh, that made things possible, uh, that made stable political action possible. The modern state, the idea that the modern state has territorial boundaries and has a right within itself to self-determination into its own processes came out of that. Um, and that with various sort of uh, um, exceptions and that sort of thing, governs at least the idea of the modern state, if not, if not the practicality. Um, that in itself is also based on the rise of print, uh, as opposed to the, uh, the, dom uh, the nomination of, of, of manuscript writing and the power of the church as the holder of, of information. Once you have a mass printing uh, a culture based on mass printing, uh, you have whole new classes of people arising in relation to information and you also have the possibility of people forming around different groups of shared ideas. In other words, you have the origin of the modern political party initially out of the, the religious sect uh, and the idea that like-minded groups of people come together with a sort of set of shared ideas about how things should proceed but also that the state... Uh, has a role in continuing its existence by controlling the circulation of print, you know, the literal idea of censorship as stopping people at the border and seeing what books they have in their suitcase, that sort of thing. Now, we're in an era now where in one short two-decade period, the material base of that has changed so utterly that the, the larger structures must change. Once you have a structure in which the transfer of written information is essentially weightless, instantaneous uh, and total uh, with all sorts of um, caveats and limitations to that in the current period but with a, that sort of categorical change then everything else changes in terms of the legitimacy of the state about what it can control, about what it can legitimately present itself as being able to control or having the right to control, who can know what, what can be prevented from being known, uh, all those sorts of questions. The point of that is that it's no longer possible for us to not ask those questions. Um, if we all accept, as I think we all do, including Assange and WikiLeaks, that total complete transparency is neither possible nor desirable, that doesn't mean at the same time that we can squeeze these new questions into old categories about who should know what uh, and, uh, and who should control what. I think one of the most important things that WikiLeaks has done, especially in a release like the Cablegate release, which shows an enormous amount of documentation that is simply mundane, boring, uh, fanciful, that sort of thing, is to start to pose the question for many people, why shouldn't we see these, this stuff? Why is it so important that this stuff be secret? Why should it be on a 30-year time rule? Why, um, uh, who decides what is secret and how do we decide what is secret? And I think that uh, as things roll on, whether via WikiLeaks or other organisations, that will be the question that comes to the fore and in historical terms, that will ultimately be why WikiLeaks matters. Thanks very much.